Hello everyone. My name is Ravi Gupta. I am from IntelliCap India Agri and Climate team. Many thanks for joining this very exciting session on supporting climate smart agriculture uh, with data driven advisory curated by GSMA, the Global Mobile Trade Association. Without much delay, I like to introduce Yan Pre, Senior Insights Manager, GSMA. Yan leads GSMA AgriTech work on climate, which focuses on how digital solutions can contribute to the climate resilience. Uh, of smallholder farmers, he drives industry research and intelligence projects to uncover best practices in service development and business models that enable service delivery at scale. I request Yan to take over and lead this session. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ravi, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining this session. Um, today we'll be discussing how data-driven advisory services can support smallholder uh, adoption of climate smart practices. Um, before we start, I'd just like to acknowledge our donors. Um, this material is being funded by um, UK Aid from the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office and is supported by the GSMA and its members. So we've got a packed agenda today. Um, I'll start by presenting a few slides uh, to, to sketch the context of today's discussion, um, after which we'll spend the majority of the time uh, discussing with our four experts how they use data-driven services to enable climate smart climate smart smallholder agriculture uh, and the challenges and enablers they face in doing so in practice. So just a few slides um, on the GSMA and Agritech program. Um, we're part of the GSMA, uh, which is the Global Trade Association of the Mobile Industry. Um, we have more than 750 mobile operators who are members um, and almost 400 companies in the broader mobile ecosystem. And within the GSMA, um, there's a not-for-profit unit called Mobile for Development, which is positioned at the intersection of the mobile ecosystem and the development sector to stimulate digital innovation and deliver both sustainable business and large-scale socioeconomic impact for the underserved. Uh, and all the work that we do under Mobile for Development is supported by donors. Um, within that sits the Agritech program. Um, our vision is to achieve equitable and sustainable food chains that empower farmers and strengthen local economies. And we do this by bringing together and supporting the mobile industry, agribusinesses, innovators, and investors in the agritech space to launch, improve, and scale impactful and commercially viable digital solutions for farmers in the developing world. And we do this um, through a range of activities. Um, our research and insights work um, informs the donor investor community, as well as service providers themselves. Uh, on the operational business models that have the highest potential for impact and sustainability. And our most recent report focuses on the intersection between data-driven advisory services and climate-smart agriculture. It explores how dynamic and contextualized advisory services can, can enable smallholder farmers to become more resilient to climate shocks by identifying and adopting relevant practices. So the following slides draw from this report to define the key concepts and provide some context to our panel discussion. So climate change is affecting food production through rising temperatures, changing precipitation patterns and greater frequency of extreme weather events. As you can see from this map, a number of climate risks challenge societies around the world with tropical areas facing risks of flooding or wildfires and arid areas becoming hotter and drier. Smallholder farmers are responsible for the food security of 2 billion people around the world, yet they are disproportionately affected by climate hazards due to their reliance on rain-fed agriculture and ecosystems that are becoming increasingly depleted and disrupted. In order to man maintain food security and improve rural livelihoods in the face of a changing climate, food systems must adapt to manage and mitigate these increasing challenges. So climate smart agriculture is a way of identifying those practices that achieve three interlinked goals, increased productivity and pro profitability, adaptation to climate change, which means the ability to anticipate, respond to, and recover from climate shocks, and the mit mitigation of climate change, meaning the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions or the sequestration of carbon from the atmosphere. And while climate smartness is defined by the ability to address these three goals in a specific context, a number of practices have been identified that are considered climate smart across a wide range of regions and crops, um, with examples including um, water management, sorry, which um, includes practices such as the, the planting of planting pitch, 
pits, which you can see in the picture in the bottom right of this slide. Uh, and this aids in soil water retention, which is a key to adaptation in dry areas. Um, intercropping two or more crops um, on one piece of land offers various benefits for productivity and adaptation. Um, and it can also sequester carbon where trees and shrubs uh, are integrated into the system. Um, however, there are a number of barriers to adopting CSA practices faced by smallholder farmers. Uh, and unmet training and information needs affect over 90% of CSA interventions. Uh, and the context-specific information required to identify and implement climate smart practices means that static uh, crop calendar-based advisory services are no longer sufficient. So, so data-driven agricultural advisory services directly address these barriers. They draw on a variety of data sources, including satellite imagery, weather information, and farm profiles to provide dynamic context-specific advisory services to support the decision-making of smallholder farmers. And digital advisory services have been shown to be a cost-effective way to improve yields and influence the adoption of beneficial agricultural practices, as well as improve farmers' ability to plant production uh, and deal with weather-related risks. And it's expected that data-driven advisory services will build on this impact through providing increasingly personalized content. Nigeria, Ken Kenya, and India are pioneers in the adoption of agri-tech innovation and have sophisticated and diverse digital agriculture ecosystems. Um, Data-driven agricultural providers in these markets were landscaped for our report in order to identify emerging trends and best practices. Um, the, the types of services we profiled include precision agriculture services, which utilize farm-specific data collected through proprietary technology to provide hyper-localized advisory services, uh, and digital climate advisory services, which combine a variety of secondary and primary data to tailor advisory messages to local and seasonal conditions. Uh, so some examples of precision agriculture service providers are Beat Drone in Nigeria, uh, who provide drone services for crop planning and monitoring, uh, and Plantix in India, which provides crop and pest and disease diagnosis uh, through image, rec image recognition de delivered through a mobile application. Um, examples of digital climate advisory services are uh, Aishamba in Kenya, which, which provide um, advisory um, only services uh, through a number of mobile channels, um, or uh, Dehat in India, which provide advisory as part of a bundle um, of agriculture services. Um, and what we found is really that data-driven services rely uh, on an ecosystem of complementary actors that, con that each contribute to the service creation steps, uh, which are data collection and analysis, content development, and service delivery. Uh, Agritech organizations are typically service owners that can contrib contribute to all of the service creation steps. They are typically either experts in the application of human-centered design, which ensures that content developed and the delivery channels used um, can effectively reach and affect be behavior change in all of the targeted groups, including marginalized groups. Um, and there are also bundled advisory services, which are typically provided by agritechs that are digitizing other value chain steps, such as crop pr procurement and input provision. Um, in these cases, advisory services are often cross-subsidized from re revenue generating activities. Agricultural research institutes are key enable enablers for data-driven services. Uh, and climate smart advisory, as they often develop or vet the quality of advisory content through expert assessment of the available data. Uh, extension services, be they public or private, provide essential ground level data collection required to build farmer profile that enable the delivery of personalized content uh, with farm location and crops cultivated being key data points. Finally, weather and precision agriculture providers add further localized data that can be used in the development of advisory, advisory content. And really the absence of any of these key roles or key actors will result in a significantly reduced ability to provide dynamic climate sensitive advisory services to smallholder farmers. So having provided some, some of the context, we'll now uh, move on to our panel discussion in which we have four speakers that represent various organizations operating in this ecosystem. So uh, I'm very grateful to be able to introduce uh, four distinguished speakers on our panel. Uh, we have uh, Krishnan uh, Palasna, who is Country Director for Digital Green in India. Um, Morup Namgal, who is Head of Agritech at IFCO Hisan in India. Um, 
I'd like to welcome uh, Boniface Akuku, um, who is Director of ICT at the Kenya Agriculture and Livestock Research Organization. Um, and last but not least, um, Annie Gosh, um, who is a scientist at Alliance Biodiversity International CIEP in Kenya. Um, so uh, we'll go through two rounds of questions. Um, first, to learn a bit more um, about the speakers um, and then and how they use data-driven approaches to enable climate smart agriculture, uh, followed by a discussion of the challenges faced in practice and how partnerships can play a role in overcoming these challenges. So um, Annie, uh, I'd like to start with you. Um, so you're part of a research organization uh, that provides some of this uh, very important content. And could you provide, um, just briefly share an overview of the work you're involved with um, at CIEP uh, and talk a bit about how it relates to climate smart agriculture specifically? Yeah, thank you, Ian. Uh, so, you know, I'd just mm -hmm. like to give a bit more background about what, you know, our organization is. So our organization is a part of a network of international agri-research institutions, uh, broadly known as CGIAR, uh, and we are you know, active across multiple countries uh, throughout the world. So as part of that uh, you know, climate-related work, we basically uh, focus on you know, two main components you can talk about. You showed a map, you know, wonderful map that shows the major risk. So we basically produce that kind of information, but at a much much more granular level to look look at, you know, uh, through different climate analytics, uh, uh, you know, recent climate data, what kind of the most prominent uh, climate risk that are uh, existing in different uh, systems, right? So that's one of the major activity that we are involved in. And the second activity is more about, you know, uh, once, we once we have known about the climate risk, uh, then what are the different adaptation solutions that we can focus on? So, and CSA being a very important of that. So on the, in this context, I would like to emphasize, you know, or highlight two uh, most two recent uh, projects that we are uh, currently involved in. So one is the Smaller Adaptation Atlas. Uh, it's a project through the Bill Mandates Foundation, and also it has been, uh, you know, the recent goalkeeper report that came out from the foundation. Uh, the climate analytics uh, it actually draws from this uh, atlas work that we have been developing. So it basically looks into the climate risk and solutions uh, in the. Uh, Past and also going forward, you know, what, what is, the, how is the climate going to change and how is the different solution domains will change. So that's basically highlights the, uh, uh, the Atlas basically highlights those different scenarios. Uh, it's focusing on Sub-Saharan Africa at this moment, and there are in a conversation on how to expand it to other parts of the world. The other activity is the Kenya uh, climate smart uh, climate risk profiles. So this is a uh, work for the last six years that we have been doing, where we are basically you know uh, contextualizing this uh, risk. Uh, climate risk in different counties, working with the different stakeholders from each counties, and uh, also uh, figuring out you know different climate smart solutions for the risk and the value chains they are facing. Uh, so you can see, like you know, the CSA is really cross cutting through uh, the you know different work that we are currently involved in. Thanks so much. Yeah, definitely. Um, sounds like you're focusing very much uh, on this um, kind of vital activity, which is developing this content around understanding you know what are the climate smart practices that are uh, that are needed and, and how can they be applied. Um, and what we found actually in our research is that that often, you know, that it's not always available, uh, certainly not for all the different value chains and all the different um, geographies. Um, could you just talk us uh, through the process of, you know, what it takes and, and, and what you do to develop this climate smart contact, uh, content, including some of the data, data sources and, and the challenges that you encounter? Yeah, sure. Uh, so the key question here is to better understand, you know, what works well, right? Like any other solutions, we need to uh, find the context. Uh, so, so that that's that's what the major challenge is, because you know, for uh, this Kenya climate risk profile that we have been working on, it took us six years because we wanted to go to each of the county, uh, we wanted to work with the county uh, stakeholders and describe them what we are finding from the you know, different climate models and how that relates with their experience of, you know, uh, you know, the climate change scenarios, like what is their perception and how the, that is matching? Because that's very important because oftentimes what happens is we find something from the modeling output. And then when you go to the, uh, 
you know, our local experts, and they have a very different type of perception. So we wanted to marry uh, both these approaches and uh, come to a common understanding of, you know, uh, where uh, we, we, we know that exactly uh, what kind of, uh, at the local context, what kind of risks are faced and what kind of solutions might work best in that context, right? Because we cannot go somewhere and, you know, uh, suggest irrigation where there is no, you know, uh, water sources. Uh, so, so this uh, activity, you know, uh, building the building with the, or co-developing with the stakeholder uh, is the most critical one, and that that's what is, uh, you know, sometimes slows the process, but also it's also very important to make the solutions more effective, uh, so that the uptake uh, there is a better uh, potential for the uptake. Thanks so much. Yeah, so, so from what I understand, there's there's a lot of kind of the um, the data collection and the analysis of, on the digital side, but actually the the on the ground component in terms of understanding uh, the community, the local communities, and and talking to the the experts there is also kind of vital to making the translation of um, the, the data to to the actual practices. Thanks so much. Um, so with that, I'd like to um, move on to um, Krishna. Uh, welcome again, and thanks so much for joining. Um, could you um, just briefly start off by sharing an overview of the services um, that Digital Green offers? Sure. Thanks, Jan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone from New Delhi, India. Uh, we have got about 70 participants here, and I want to start with uh, who a farmer is. So on one hand, on one side, we have got somebody who has to understand plant science, who has to understand soil chemistry, who has to understand mathematics, finance, markets, and all those related aspects. If a farmer is a company would have been having six vice presidents to manage all those functions. On the other side of it, the same farmer is expected to ensure the local food security, generate employment at the local level, ensure productivity, as well as contribute to rural economy. Now, there's an enormous responsibility on a farmer who is herself quite poor and increasingly fighting the complexities, uncertainties, and the challenges of the world. So if you are able to ensure that the farmers are prosperous, it is going to have a multiplier effect on the overall society itself. And the mission of Digital Green is to work with those small and marginal farmers to prosper by using technology and data. We are a global not-for-profit uh, based out of uh, headquartered in California uh, uh, state USA, and we are working across nine countries and have reached over 3.5 million farmers working very closely with the governments, including building the capacity of extension system by training and increasing the skill of about 40,000 odd people. There are three pathways to our work. First is we are offering targeted advisories to digital tools and platforms so that the farmers are able to produce better and they're able to navigate the value chain. The secondly, we are building the capacities of farmer collectives to organize their data, own it and control it for their own benefit. And the third one, we are also offering a secure data exchange platform uh, for the ecosystem itself to offer higher value proposition for the farmers. So this is what we do as an organization in which the gender and climate are cross-cutting initiatives. Whatever we do, these things are addressed. In addition to that, Climate Smart Agriculture holds a special place in organizational uh, priorities, and we are having dedicated programs around Climate Smart Agriculture. This is about us. Thanks so much, Krishna. That's a, that's a very clear overview and, and, and really comes through strongly that you are kind of on the farmer facing side and really kind of specializing in, in understanding how, you know, how to empower farmers there. Mm -hmm. um, could, could you just talk a little bit more about um, um, how this empowerment works and how um, you're working towards um, behavior change and, and maybe provide some examples of how your services encourage CSA adoption among smallholder farmers? Sure. The, the targeted program that we are having on Climate Smart Agriculture has three parts to it. The first part is that we are providing video-based advisories to induce behavior change and adopt climate smart production practices by farmers. We convert high-level technical outputs into stories, into content that the farmers can easily understand and disseminate it through short videos using multiple platforms. These advisories also help farmers to understand the immediate benefits of switching to climate smart agriculture. The second part of it is we are collecting data as a part of this through a digital wallet. 
This wallet is owned by the farmer that helps them to hold that data themselves. And this data not only helps us in tailoring advisories to specific farmers' needs, but also to quantify emissions from the farms itself. And these emissions, when we are comparing it over a period of time, also helps us how these farming practices, how climate smart farming practices are helping to reduce uh, carbon emissions from the farm sector. And the third part of it is how to use this data for the benefit of farmers themselves in terms of accessing premium markets, ensuring certification, even including uh, you know, carbon credit in the, in the days to come, and for which we need a reliable, trustworthy data uh, that is for the ecosystem. So these are the three parts to what we are doing. And specifically, talking about advisories, a few things that we have understood is, number one, if a farmer has to change the behavior and switch to climate smart practices, they need to find immediate benefit. So how do we show tangible benefits that will motivate the farmer to immediately switch? And the first benefit that comes across is reduced input costs, reduced fertilizer, reduced land management practices costs, reduce labor and reduce water usage. That's an immediate benefit that they're able to find. And the second thing is that if you cannot have a one size fits all solution, every farmer's condition context is very different. And how do we ensure that they are receiving very specific tailor-made advisory to meet their pain points is something that we have specialized in. And the, the technology and the digital solution offers us a, a possibility of providing that targeted advisories at scale. And the third part of it is, you know, while, while, while the technology or the internet connectivity is booming, only about 20-25% of the farmers have access to smartphones right now. So we need to use, while using smartphones, we also need to ensure that, that other farmers who are the last mile connectivity, who, uh, who do not have uh, smartphones, are also able to reap the fruits of climate smart agriculture as, as they, are, uh, as, as they uh, continue in their cultivation. So the whole idea of using advisories is to ensure that farmers are getting tangible benefits and there's a societal behavioral change that happens in adopting climate smart practices. Thanks so much. That's very clear. And, and you make a good point that it's not enough to just provide advisory. It needs to be packaged and personalized in a way um, that farmers recognize the benefit and are able to kind of adapt their practices. Thanks so much. Um, so um, Boniface, I'd like to um, turn to you. Um, also welcome again uh, and thanks for joining. Um, could you talk a little bit more about your um, your work and the projects that you're involved in at uh, Calro uh, in Kenya? Okay, thank you, Jan. Uh, thank you, everybody in attendance. Yes, I think what we discovered uh, 10 years ago is that it's not the absence or lack of information, data, or knowledge that can support farmers. But the problem has been how can we make it available, accessible, and usable. And in that context, we decided to digitize all the research knowledge and information and data that's available so that it can be available anywhere, anytime, any device uh, that can be easily be accessed and usable. And uh, to do so, we realized that we needed to create an enabling environment where we need, uh, as a government or as part of the government, we need to support the private sector. So we invested in the big data platform, uh, which is a robust data infrastructure that enable us to ingest and harvest all the research data, all the technical data within the country that again can also help both private sector and public sector to make it available, accessible and usable. And the third thing we did is that people have been talking about, and even in this conference, talk about changing the life of farmers. The question then is, how do you change the life of a farmer if you somebody you don't know? And for us to be able to act, uh, properly understand the farmers, uh, their pain points, their capacity, we embarked on digitizing and georeferencing, geomapping, profiling those farmers so that we can understand the environment, have the GPS going on their farm so that we can be able to understand the climate conditions of their farm, the weather conditions in their farms. And this was quite uh, one thing. The last thing we've done is that uh, having data is not just enough. We will have the data, we'll have the knowledge and the information available digitized, but how then do we turn them into services and then disseminate them to farmers? And therefore, we decided now to disseminate, uh, turn this data into services, into agronomic advisories, pest advisories, weather advisories, market advisories, and we realize that technology can also be exclusive. 
And therefore, we came up with four channels through which we are disseminating the information and the services. There's a web portal, USSD, and SMS platform. But also, what about farmers who don't have smartphones? We also have a call center by which they can call in, which is IVRS integrate, integrated, where they can either speak to, uh, I mean, get response from automatic recorded system, or they can speak to agents. That's what we do. Thanks so much. That's, uh, um, yeah, very uh, kind of uh, comprehensive um, kind of activities around, um, you know, digitizing um, some of the data, uh, you know, integrating data sources, collecting data, but then also um, developing services on top of that data. Um, could you just talk maybe a little bit more into um, kind of how this data is, is feeding into um, enabling climate smart agriculture uh, within the work that you do? Yeah, climate is at the center of what we're doing. Uh, because the climate has changed and therefore agriculture has changed. Uh, we all know that uh, we need to ask the few questions. How do you produce more? Because by 2050, the world needs 70% additional food production. But the question that begs in, in the wake of climate change, how do you produce more with less water, less land, less fertilizer, less chemicals, and not hurting the environment? And therefore, whatever we're doing, we must take care of climate. And therefore, we, uh, we, what, what we're doing is that we decided to integrate the different data sets from weather, from climate, from market, from research, uh, from farmers, so that we are able basically to analyze this data, be able to come up with the predictive uh, predictions, be able to come with prescription, and uh, which we now turn to advisors. For example, we have a platform that gives weather forecast accurately by three by three kilometer uh, radius, which is basically covers your farm. We can also give you advisories based on your farm. And uh, we are using satellite data, uh, which gives charts and amount. But the challenge is we just tell farmers it's likely to rain. How likely is likely? And therefore, we are using um, cl uh, climate technologies where we're using big data analytics, deep learning to be able to uh, uh, analyze, do the run models, run analytics, be able to analyze and precisely give advice that can address climate uh, change effects. For example, farmers need to know whether it will rain or not, the chance and amount. Number two, they need to know what to plant where or what to keep where if they are livestock farmers. And therefore we're having, a, we run another model uh, we call the selector, which help you to know what you can plant, when and where and how. So that's how we're integrating the climate uh, solution into the, the whole uh, ecosystem. Thanks so much. So I hear a, a lot of effort is going into localization and, and, and being able to forecast and, and predict uh, kind of weather, weather hazards and, and, and weather events in order to provide uh, efficient advisory. Thanks so much. Um, so Marup, um, uh, turning to you now, also welcome again, and thanks for joining. Thank you, Jan. Thanks. Um, yeah, could you just start off by uh, maybe just uh, introducing the, the kind of work and, and, and the services that, that is offered uh, by IFCO Kisan? Sure. Uh, so uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening uh, to all the viewers across the timelines. Uh, you know, before I start, uh, I'd like to really appreciate and the points that uh, made by my colleagues, uh, Mr. Christian, Mr. Boniface, how a farmer, you know, a farmer, uh, Staying in a rural place is expected to do a lot of things, whereas he's the, the he or she is the least empowered person. I think that's that that's got to change, and we believe with uh, all the efforts uh, a lot of our people are doing it, it, it can change, and soon a lot of things are improving. At least uh, something that I can say. So uh, about Ifku Kisan, I work for Ifku Kisan. We are a subsidiary of Indian Farmer Fertilizer Cooperative, one of the largest rural cooperatives of India. Uh, we're connected with almost one third of the rural population directly or indirectly through our products and services. Uh, as a group, we have been serving the farmers for over 50 years. Uh, we are united by the passion of farming better and an unwavering commitment to support the farming communities across the country. Uh, every day we touch thousands of farmers in the most efficient and sustainable way possible. Uh, our model is very simple. Uh, we empower the farmers with curated contextual farm advisories in the local language in daily, on a daily basis. And we do it in both voice and text form. And we're perfectly capable of disseminating across the platforms so with voice calls, SMS, social media, any other platform that you can talk about, we're capable of doing it. We want to reach the right audience through the right platform as well. 
And our journey in the tech uh, perusal has been kind of evolutionary, I would say. And uh, as we realize that gathering data for about the farmer, not just about the farmer, but about the farm dynamically is very critical to efficiently curate the advisories per farmer basis. Uh, given the scale that we're operating at, it, it, is, it becomes more than important for us to gather those farm-based data points. Uh, we serve around 4 million farmers on what we call our green SIM card. Uh, it's a very simple platform where uh, the communication happens to a farmer. Any farmer using a basic feature phone can be empowered with these customized advisories on real-time basis, almost daily basis as well. Then we have another 1 million farmers on our mobile app, uh, where again, uh, the chances for us to gather a little bit more data points and so that our curation, our, uh, our, our service becomes much more critical and much more efficient in that cases. And then we have uh, uh, journeyed towards another platform which we call it Krishi Devgyan. Uh, you know, if I translate in, 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 in English, it uh, means something like uh, farming uh, knowledge by God. So by God, we meant to say uh, something which is coming through the AI. AI. So it's something that we have utilized AI streams at the back end when these recommendations are coming automatically without much of an, uh, you know, uh, influence uh, uh, by, by uh, our experts. Uh, so we have around 40,000 plus acres across the country where, from where we gather near real-time data points through the remote sensing, IOC, IOC sensors and all. Thus, we are able to predict certain things better, suggest something better, and uh, you know, uh, and uh, forecast some things better. Uh, now, as an agri-tech uh, company, as I said, we have been uh, there for long. We understand that the last five farmers are not really benefited by the agri-tech wave in India. Uh, we realize this too. And, uh, and our answer was that, you know, uh, only a technology cannot be answered to this problem. A hybrid assisted model of tech and tradition know-how uh, on, on ground staff is something that is actually required uh, is what we believe. And with the climate change actually uh, questioning or, uh, you know, testing the farmer's knowledge on all these things, we believe that tech is becoming more, than, uh, more and more important. So we have graduated from an only advisory service to up in agency offering turnkey backfill solution to agribusiness and across the stakeholders we play farmer uh, remains the uh, in the center of the uh, center of the whole uh, of, the, of the whole ecosystem so that we benefit them more uh, in this pursuit we have taken up various programs we've looked at uh, various other programs which can really help us uh, uh, do this particular work uh, we found that there is a lack of trusted organized brand who does this work uh, and most of this work is currently done by middle men who are, uns who are scattered, unorganized, and keeping the farmer away from the market and business know-how. So we want to step in here and play that role uh, and see that can we actually offer complete turnkey business. On one side, we have the buyers, and on one side, we have the farmers. And uh, uh, we integrate both these guys through technology and our on-ground support. Uh, we've taken up certain progresses, such as uh, you know one of the key projects that we're running right now up is uh, bio fortified crops, you no know, CBC commercialization of bio fortified One of the CGIS partners, Harvest Plus, mm -hmm. uh, we're again working with them to actually offer complete seed to market uh, offerings for the farmers and the agribusiness. And this has made only been possible through the cutting edge technology integrations. And we have done it from some other crops such as chilies, tomato, ashwagandha, and we want to add more and more crop profiles so that we can include most of the farmers uh, in all the profiles. So as I said. From the advisories to the cutting edge technology, we want to you know, add the farmers in all these three buckets. And most of the the last bucket is something that we're really keen to empower these farmers. So this is in a nutshell what Ifko Kisan does, and uh, that's been our operation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mora. So yeah, here again, kind of the um, you know, the, there's the digital aspect, but uh, very strongly there's a need of, of, of you know, deepening kind of your on the ground activities. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And really interesting to hear that actually kind of the, the climate smart work that you're doing is through kind of enabling um, value chains and uh, through um, kind of uh, full value chain digitized services that, that, that can enable farmers to, to, to uptake these practices. Uh, so thanks so much. Um, I'm actually going to move to the, um, the second round of questioning now. Um, uh, and I'd like to, I, I can see that people have already been um, um, putting questions into the Hoover app. So um, please keep those coming. We'll, we'll come to those at the end of our discussion round. Um, I'd like to go back to um, uh, Annie um, and just um, learn a little bit more um, on about how you um, work with partners um, to ensure um, your, you know, your work has, has a maximum impact and reaches smallholder farmers. 
Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, uh, the answer is quite clear. Uh, listening to the kind of model and uh, Krishnan is basically to work with uh, partners who are the farmer facing organizations. So in Kenya, we partner with an uh, uh, organization called Media Eye, and they run two very successful farmer dissemination program. One is called Shamba Shepap, and this is called Aishama. So Shamba Shepap is a TV program, farm makeover show. And it has a huge reach. It reaches around eight, 8 million uh, you know, viewers every week. So what we do, you know, we, we, I talked about this uh, climate risk profiles uh, and uh, climate smart agriculture contents that we developed. So we basically work with uh, Shama Shepap to, you know, give that a different uh, uh, uh uh, view right, so we uh, you know digital green has been doing a lot of video message uh, video uh, content creation, but in this case the video content is actually uh, you know recorded on the farmers field and it goes on live on air on TV. So that has we have seen that you know uh, even uh, at this moment you know different. Uh, you know, between different type of digital media that we can use, TV has a huge reach. And the next component is uh, working with a, you know, a sister organization to Shamba Shepap is iShamba, which is a mobile advisory platform. Uh, and that also, uh, you know, reaches around 600,000 uh, farmers, a network uh, that they have across Kenya. So uh, what uh, iShamba does is basically takes this kind of content that goes into the, uh, you know, TV program and make it, you know, translated uh, to, uh, you know, 140 character, you know, text messages that follows the, the TV programs. And the farmers also have the option to, you know, call in the iShamba call center and learn more about it. Now, this is what I say, you know, more of a passive, you know, uh, behavioral change in, in the CSS sector. Now, if we have to make, you know, real, uh, you know, other changes, then we have to also empower uh, the farmers with the different services, you know, that goes along uh, with the advisory, right? Like we can ask the farmer to do, you know, uh, mulching. We can ask the farmer to do, uh, you know, follow certain CSA practices, but the farmers need the capital. So for doing that, we, uh, and they also need to protect their protection, uh, protect their, you know, uh, production. So to do that, we also work with different financial organizations. Uh, so for example, we work with Econ Africa in uh, Kenya. They are primarily insurance service provider. So we bundle the, uh, you know, agro advisory related to CSA uh, with insurance. Uh, also, we work with you know companies like Eclav who are uh, and financial access who are developing you know different lending products. So we have been working with them to develop climate smart lending product. You know, mainstreaming the climate change into or climate risk into the lending product itself. Uh, so that's kind of a new innovation that we have been focusing on. So these are you know these are uh, some of the examples of how we are you know maximizing our impact you know, uh, translating the research into uh, something that is more uh, usable for the farmer. Thank you. Thanks so much, Annie. So again, um, uh, the, the importance of bundling services and actually enabling um, farmer behavior change uh, is coming through again there and kind of echoing what, what Mark was talking about earlier yeah. on. Um, just as a research organization, I, un I understand that, you know, evidence on CSA impact is, is quite scarce, um, but actually quite important to, you know, identify um, best practices and also kind of enable in, for more investment into this field. Could you just talk maybe very briefly um, to the role that research institutes, uh, agritech providers uh, and other actors in the ecosystem can play in building this evidence base? Yeah, I, I, that's a great question, and uh, I don't know if there is a simple solution to that, because, uh, you know, what we want to have here, you know, uh, the reason um, we sit in a very unique position, because, you know, we have this kind of, you know, uh, communication or collaboration going on with the farmer facing organization, the public sector organization, the, you know, investment uh, 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 donors, so... So what we feel like is we lack the data, right? So we need to have, uh, we need to mainstream uh, the kind of infrastructure that digital green has been, uh, you know, working on. Like you know, farmer own their own, uh, farmer should own their data, and they also get the benefits uh, when the data is being used, you know, for. Uh, in fact, developing their uh, developing solutions that it, that will be used by farmers, right? So uh, I think there uh, the the biggest challenge we have is how this data can flow between different organizations, but also maintaining the data privacy and uh, other other related concerns. So th this is the you know. Uh, key what we feel like that needs to be uh, addressed, you know, through uh, different type of collaborations that we are having uh, in, in, in this sector. 
Great, thanks so much. And that, that's kind of echoing again what, what Krishnan was talking about yeah. in, in terms of empowering farmers by being able to kind of, you know, collect and own their own data and, and being exactly. able to, to, to share that data and uh, but yet still remain kind of in control about how it's used. Yeah. Um, thanks so much. Moving on um, to, to Krishnan again. Um, you, you mentioned earlier that, you know, enabling behavior change is really, um, it's really important to have personalized advisory and, and to demonstrate tangible benefits. Um, in, de in, in developing services that meet, you know, these requirements, could you just talk us through some of the kind of main challenges uh, that you encounter? Sure, yeah. And before that, uh, the, the beauty of such platforms, uh, platforms is also the learnings that you have in the partnership that emerges. They'll surely be in touch with any uh, in the days to come uh, uh, to explore uh, ways of working together. Thanks for that. Um, yeah. Um, you know, what Climate Smart Agriculture requires, as I mentioned earlier, is there is no one-size-fits-all solution. Even if we take a particular commodity, you know, uh, the, 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 the soil type, the weather, uh, the, the agricultural practices change even from district to district in India, uh, that, that the diversity and then the variety and the fragmented nature of uh, a small holding or, or small scale production in India or anywhere in the world for that matter, requires very specific, preci precise, targeted uh, information to go. And what are those challenges uh, that happen around the way? Number one, in any advisory, I mean, all experts will agree, content is the king, right? And you cannot have a content that is centrally produced and then distributed mass scale across the nation or across the geography. It has to be very specific, very localized. And we have methods of how to do that, how to come out with that uh, uh, localized content and yet use technology to ramp it at scale, right? So that, that's number one. So content generation, uh, continuous content generation, that is locally understandable, that is locally relevant, that uh, that meets the requirements of the local people and address their problem is one challenge, right? The second challenge is uh, data, right? In spite of we all agreeing that data is so crucial for any climate smart agriculture application, uh, continuous flow of trustworthy, enriched, timely data that will not only help farmers to access information and advisories that are relevant to them, but also help farmers to reap the benefits of that data or monetize that data at a later point of time is very crucial, right? And, and it's very important for us, for the ecosystem to build that confidence among farmers to help them generate timely, accurate data on a regular basis, right? And here, uh, specifically around climate smart agriculture, what we have noticed is that we don't need static data. What we need is the dynamic data about how much water did they use? What kind of fertilizer? When did they apply that fertilizer? What is the land management practice that they have, which is very different from the static data that is static data that is typically collected, right? So a robust uh, data collection is very important for this. The third one is, you know, a lack of almost non-existent uh, measurement reporting verification system in agricultural sector. Of course, experiments have happened, but they have been very costly. How do we come out with a scalable, impactful MRV system for the agriculture sector is very interesting, very important. We are currently piloting uh, one such initiative in Bihar. Uh, I have uh, discussed that with Jan before, where we are actually uh, using data triangulation to come out with that reliable, trustworthy data for an, for an MRV. And to, in, in that case, how do we actually combine the farmer level data to some of those public data sets like satellite data, weather data, et cetera, is, is going to be very, very important. And the fourth challenge is, uh, while it is a blessing, it can also be a challenge is working with public institutions and the governments, right? Uh, particularly, uh, uh, you know, uh, ex meeting those expectations. And while, while the vision, while the objective, where the goals might be, quite similar at the, at the higher level. As we go down the ladder of uh, the, that system, it becomes quite challenging with multiple priorities that they have on, on ground at various points of time. So that is both uh, uh, opportunity as well as a challenge that I find. So four challenges uh, that I mentioned so far uh, towards ensuring a efficient CSA system. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Krishnan. Uh, and just just in keeping with that um, uh, kind of necessity to you know have have this ground level more efforts and ground level data connection, I'd like to um, ask you, Bunny Fess. Um, you mentioned that that some of the, one of the areas of your work is to focus on capacity building of of local 
agencies and farmer facing organizations. Could you talk through, you know, the need for, you know, the capacity, capacity building of these organizations and, and the, the kind of the work that you're doing there? Thank you, Jan, once again. Yes, I think um, our partnership philosophy is that no one can make it alone or can do it alone. <clears throat> and then we realize that, uh, as I said earlier, we are trying to address the challenges that are facing farmers in terms of how do we make the information or knowledge or data available to them, accessible and usable. And therefore, we realize that uh, the aspect of um, capacity building is quite key particularly talk about climate, climate smart technologies or talk about uh, digitization, we realize that uh, it's very good, it's important to build the capacity. So what we're doing, that we have trained out of the 2.9 million farmers we have in our database, we have trained over 1 million of those farmers. So we've been training those farmers directly. Uh, we realize that we need to deal with farmers directly, and we also need to deal with farmer-facing organizations, and we also need to deal with government. This is because... Uh, because we give direct adversity to farmers, so therefore it's important to build their capacity that they are able to use these uh, adversaries with them. Because if it's just, just one thing to, to uh, give adversaries and give services, and it's another thing for them to be used. And therefore we realize that capacity building is key in ensuring that the usability uh, of this adversary or these services is actually there. So we've been training farmers directly, we have been training, uh, working with uh, farmer facing organizations like um, we have about 20, over 30 private sector actors, innovators that are giving farmers um, you know, advisories and the services we, we work with, giving them data, training, and support. We work with the county government. We also work with the national government to be able to build the capacity and also to provide not only capacity in training, but also capacity in providing them with the right information with the right data, with the right knowledge, because Carlo is a kitchen where agricultural knowledge, data, and information is being cooked. And therefore, we know that we need a very active public sector and a very active private sector. Yeah. Thanks so much. So it's, it's yeah, really about enabling, enabling the, the farmer-facing organizations to make use of all this advisory and, and, and be able to put it into practice. Thank you. I'm just conscious of time, so I'll ask... Um, uh, one last question um, to Mora um, before we open to questions to, uh, from the audience. Um, you were talking about the kind of the end end to end um, approach in in providing um, services, um, and I, I, I was impressed by this because it's a kind of a novel way that opens up uh, kind of new value chains to farmers. And I would like to understand a bit more about the the, the business model uh, behind behind this end to end approach, um, and how you know how that works and how it potentially scales to new value chains. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Jan. Uh, that's a great question. So, you know, uh, the, the challenge, or let's, so let me start with the challenge. I think the reason why an agribusiness or any buyer uh, is not actually uh, willing to directly connect with the farmers, or the small farmer in this case, particularly, is because there is a lack of facility, a lack of trust, and a lot of other supply chain issues, of course. Now, the concept which uh, Government of India is really promoting right now is the concept of farmer producers organization. So, you know, government is really bullish to actually scale it up to 10,000 ones and, and, and it's going great, right? Uh, uh, and I think this should be a game changer where uh, if everything goes on as we plan, this, this can really change the scenario of Indian agriculture. Uh, our case is something very we are also trying to dovetail or utilize this uh, whole idea. The only challenge that we see is that there is a lack of uh, data, farm level data, which many of my colleagues also mentioned. So if you look at the challenge most of these guys are facing is the lack of farm level data and data across the data, uh, disintegrated, disintegrated stakeholders in the supply chain. I think with, uh, so, so to say, a digital twin of a farm is something missing, which is really prohibiting these farmers to progress uh, and uh, to take a call whether to go for uh, uh, variety A or variety. So that's the challenge on the front. I think the technology will change. Now the next set of technology, next set of challenge, I think uh, what uh, these FPOs, if they're not empowered with these technologies, if they're not capacity built on this front, I think the challenge would be that uh, while we'll have armies of uh, FPOs or the farmer clusters, what we've observed is that most of these agribusinesses or the FPOs, do, they do not have the trained executives who can utilize these technologies which are existing already. So uh, that's something. So our case is that we want to work on both fronts, not just for the farmer, but also for the FPOs as well. And we believe if we're able to streamline and empower these two guys, on the farmer front, we have different apps and technologies which will be more farmer-focused, 
uh, something like suggestions only that you know okay you, this is the this is if you if you are belonging to demography a geography a maybe this is the best time for you to grow variety a so that's kind of recommendation simply wanted to how do we do that unless we have the digital twin of that we will be able to do that it's a case of get gathering more data and making it better we take help from you know uh, 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 mr anvil here researchers like them they are working on this recommendation that these are something already available and what we do is that we try to get those things make it reach to the last mile and make it public so that as many data points we gather so that becomes empowerment on the farmer side on the fpo side which is a gather uh, which is a which is a consortium of these small farmers if you are able to empower them with these things if you are if you are able to uh, train these guys on using these technologies i think that could be a game this is exactly what we are doing and Uh, and when we are able, once we are able to establish these two connections these two chains uh, our case is that we just go to buyers so buyers a uh, lot of people agribusiness we have uh, chatted with them then they said okay the only reason we are not going is the consistency it's completely unorganized and now that we have this unorganized thing and you know everything is traceable all the digital twins are available their confidence goes higher and uh, it and it becomes a case of them actually saying that okay this is the kind of right specification right parameters right quality that we're looking at we're looking at ipf we're looking at gap and then we go back to this farmers and ensure that okay this is this one needs to be grown and with the help of technology we are able to do this so a very simple model uh, once we are able to do the ground work as in when the fpos or the uh, other farmers were able to empower we go back to these guys and say that we can grow this if whatever specification they're looking for we can do it completely data driven so this is something we are doing differently from a average middleman who is completely unorganized as i stated earlier in the process while we are doing a similar activity what we are actually doing is that we are actually empowering the last mile farmer and you know as an add on i think there was a uh, somebody somebody put it in a chat box as well you know what about the carbon credits this is a good opportunity for us to actually uh, you know sustainably empower these technology because these are coming at a cost and we believe that with the kind of traceability or the digital twin that we are able to generate per farm wise we can we are now looking at uh, at add on offers such as carbon trading in something and which can really benefit across the stakeholders again so we are going uh, as a simple model uh, a couple of a couple of uh, projects which have really taken off so far is a cbc program which i mentioned uh, the beauty of beauty of about this project is that this is a complete variety which is not only going to fetch them a premium which i'm hopeful about but also really this is also benefiting on the nutrition revolution side because a bio fortified variety will offer any farmer an addition uh, of uh, let's say 20 to 34% more ppm uh, 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 that could be of iron zinc and other varieties and what happens is that an average farmer whatever total production is they tend to keep 10 to 20% of the produce for their own consumption so if they grow such a kind of produce uh, uh, we're not only benefiting them Uh, by the whole supply chain correction but in the process we're also benefiting their uh, nutrition and their health part as well so that's how we work uh, we uh, we want to build a uh, connection across the chain we go back to the agri business uh, get the demand and then we fulfill it and so yeah thank very you. simple work. thank you thanks thanks so much more okay now I'd, i'd like to quickly shift over to to some of the questions that have come from the audience uh as uh, time is running short so Um the first uh question that uh, kind of sticks out to me is um what is the panel's take on the choice overload faced by smallholder farmers in select- selecting technology providers to work with um and what are some of the ways in which smallholder farmers can be ma- made aware of new climate smart technologies so i guess um, perhaps let's focus on the um the first question so choice overload faced by smallholder farmers in selecting technology providers to work with um uh maybe i can um pose that to um annie uh, is is this kind of a, an, an issue that you see um happening in practice and um yeah how, how does one deal with that uh, yeah that's that's a you know good question so uh, it's it's uh, it's very difficult to answer because uh, it, it it depends on the region we are working in so far in kenya right you know like i can talk I, i can say that you know probably not much uh, out there in, in that respect but when it comes to the country uh, you know like india you know it, it might be a situation where you have so many actors and uh, uh, so uh, so unfortunately you know we, we don't have you know yelp or uh, google review system uh, for the uh, 
uh, uh, for, for, for the you know, APOs or the service providers. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, I think uh, they're, at this point, the whole ecosystem is growing and there is there may not be oversight uh, but at, at at near future you know when uh, there would be you know uh, enough government uh, government intervention government interest uh, there might be you know uh, opportunities to uh, resolve this issue but right now i think that this is not a problem i, I think this this is something you know we, we should have as much as possible and then let us see if it becomes a problem you know in, in, in the african continent i can I, I can even generalize you know from kenya to other countries but uh, i'd also like to hear from the indian colleagues what they uh, think thanks thanks any um perhaps just uh, in the interest of time i'd like to just move on to 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 one other audience um question because it's it's uh, touching on a uh, theme that's already been discussed, uh, which is around carbon credits um, being issued for climate smart agri agriculture practices. And I know, um, Krishnan, that this is um, kind of an area work of work that uh, Digital Green um, is focusing on. Um, can you just maybe briefly touch on kind of where you are with that and, and what the, you know, the hope is that you know, carbon credits can achieve uh, for smallholder agriculture? Sure, thanks. Uh, uh, of course, we are uh, very keenly studying uh, the, the emerging regulations and policies around carbon credit in India. And I think government has already come out with uh, uh, the necessary guidelines towards a carbon market in India. And it is expected that within a year or so, we are going to have a very clear regulation policy around carbon credit, right? There have been experiments in the past on helping the farmers to, uh, or uh, using the farm level data uh, actually to uh, avail uh, carbon credit. but those carbon, those credits were actually more, more used by the intermediary organization than the farmers themselves, right? What we are now trying to do is that the pilot that we are doing in the state of Bihar with about 30,000 farmers at this point of time is that how farmers themselves can actually benefit or monetize the, the data that they are uh, holding, right? And that data that they are holding is through what we call as a data wallet, which gives them the, gives them the option of even sharing the data or having consent or built-in consent to share the data with whom they want, rather than somebody else collecting and using the data on behalf of farmers themselves, right? So I would uh, rather suggest there, there is no clarity in terms of how uh, it's going to emerge, but keep this, uh, uh, watch this space for the uh, for the next few months or so. I think there is exciting times for carbon credit in India in the farming sector. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much indeed. It is, a, it is a very exciting space. I feel there's a lot of buzz around it, um, but still, kind of no no crystallization of uh, kind of uh, how that solution is going to look. So yeah, we'll definitely be keep, keeping an eye on that. Um, unfortunately, that brings us to, to time. Um, and yeah, with this, you know, limited time, we're, of course, only able to touch on, on a number of themes relevant to this space. And I can see in the chat also, there's there's quite a few questions. So a lot of interest there. Um, unfortunately, we won't be able to, to, to address those. Um, but thanks so much for, for the input. And if, if you're interested in learning more about this topic, please please do um, go to the GSMA website um, under Mobile for Development Agritech, um, where you can find our report and, and read up more about this. Um, I'd just like to finish by thanking the panel once again for your time and for your, for your contribution to this session. Uh, I think it was a really interesting discussion and, and many thanks again to the audience um, for your interest and, and for, for, for the questions that you've, uh, you've posed. Um, so with that, I'd like to wrap up the session. Um, thanks so much, everyone. And um, please feel free um, to reach out to me via the Hoover channel uh, to continue the discussion uh, if you're interested. Thanks so much, everyone.